I'm Melissa. And I'm Jam. And I'm a chemist. And I'm not. And welcome to Chemistry for Your Life. The podcast that helps you understand the chemistry of your everyday life. Are you ready to learn more about smells? I am so ready. We're going to talk about why some things smell so strongly bad to us. Okay. You're going to tell it back to me. And then I'm going to give you some fun smell facts as a bonus for your proper explanation. Okay. So basically... Everything, all these fun facts are riding on me getting this right. Just the two fun facts. Yeah. Okay. At the end. All right. All right, folks. Be cheering me on. For all of our sake, we get to hear these cool fun facts if I get this right. So. (laughs) Okay. So we talked about our olfactory receptors last time. Uh That those are controlled by genetics. Uh They're about 800 in humans. 400 of those seem to be active. Okay. There's 1,000 in mice, in case you're wondering. Whoa. That are active? I don't know if they're active. And about 10, no, and about 100 in monkeys, I think. What about dogs? I don't know. Probably more. Yeah, because they're like all about the nose. I did read a book uh, about forensic science that said that the reasons that dogs could smell part of like how dogs could smell so well and why they wrinkle up their face is they hold the smells in their wrinkles and then they can sort of unfurrow to get a little reminder of what it smells like. And the reason their ears kind of are so long is so they can kick up the smells with their ears. I heard about the the ears thing only because one of my dogs is a beagle and he's got Mm. long ears and he's, he's bred for that kind of deal. And he sure can. He can find smells. Oh yeah. One time he destroyed... He didn't really destroy. One time he made a significant (laughs) material alteration to a backpack of mine in search of empty Tupperware that had once contained food but didn't anymore. Yeah. He uh, caused a wardrobe malfunction on your backpack there. A (laughs) hundred percent. Yeah. And that's a common thing. I mean, like a lot of dogs can do that, but any sort of hound is like even more smell driven. Like it's almost like it drives them crazy. Inside a backpack inside a lunchbox yeah. in a closed Tupperware inside of a safe in <laughs> the ocean <laughs> and he still got it but I kept using that backpack until it got doused in dichloromethane oh okay Don't and that, did he do that too that he was in the lab and there was an accident yeah yeah, yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> he's a little clumsy okay so without thumbs different ones of those different receptors will detect for different things okay okay One major class of smells Mm -hmm. that we detect for is a sulfur-containing compound called thiols. Okay. Thiols are also sometimes called mercaptans because they react with mercury. They're mercury captures, so Mm -hmm. mercaptans. Like a a mermaid or merman, but it's a captain. Except a mercury captain. Got it. Mercury captain. Taker. Okay. So mercaptans or thiols are interchangeable. People okay. have heard those before. I think it's a fun name, mercaptans. And now this is in response to a question that we asked, were asked after our hair episode mm-hmm. from Joey H. Mm-hmm. The question was, why doesn't our ha- hair smell bad like sulfur? And the class of sulfur compounds that we usually can detect so strongly Mm -hmm. is actually sulfur bonded to a hydrogen. Okay. That's a special functional group. Uh We talked about functional groups being an arrangement of atoms back in the very first episode that we talked about amino acids, the Maillard reaction. Mm -hmm. And that functional group is any carbon containing compound with a sulfur bonded to a hydrogen. Okay. So those have the smell that we detect for. That functional group, I do not think is present in our hair. Okay. It's sulfur is bonded within the bigger system of the cysteine. Mm -hmm. So that's answering Joey's question. Shout out, Joey. But we do detect for the thiol smell. Now, what's interesting Uh is thiols are very similar to alcohols. Okay. Alcohols are a functional group with an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. Okay. So instead of a sulfur bonded to a hydrogen, it's an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. Got it. 
and sulfur and oxygen are in the same column on the periodic table. Uh And usually if you switch out those atoms that are in the same column, they will have very similar chemistry. Oh, interesting. Because they have the same number of electrons around them. Mm -hmm. They are usually very similar, not exactly the same. Got it. In this case, this is amazing to me because I'm so used to alcohols and thiols reacting and acting similarly in chemical environments. Uh Uh-huh. We are 100 million more times sensitive to sulfur compounds, the thiols, than the alcohol compounds. Really? With a very similar structure, with very simil- similar chemistry, uh-huh. we are 1 million more times sensitive to one than the other. What the heck? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, a million times is a little excessive. Not one million, one hundred million. Oh my gosh. Couldn't it just been ten? Like <laughs> how, why do we need it to be so high? Well, it's because of survival. Oh, okay. Those thiols, those sulfur containing compounds, are in rotten food, dead animals, mm-hmm. poisonous gases, not all poisonous gases, mm-hmm. but some. Yeah. And even some carnivores, which would theoretically be our predators uh-huh. can sweat out and ex- excrete sulfur containing compounds in their sweat. So it's almost for uh-huh. safety. Whoa. That's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. I literally, the next line I have written is, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> did I ever tell you, I think I did tell you this, but I don't think I told you on air about when I posted a story about sulfur, um, like geothermal, pools and stuff like that when we were in New Zealand. There's, there's a specific mm-hmm. yes. town we we're in called Rotorua, which seriously, no matter where you go in Rotorua, it does smell like sulfur. They, it's so much geothermal. Yeah. So many geothermal pools and like steaming pools and even just kind of steam coming out of the ground in different places and stuff like that. Just so geothermal active everywhere mm-hmm. that the entire town smells like sulfur. So a little bit like rotten eggs. Yes. Not was, a great smelling town. It was rough. But like, obviously the pools looked super cool. And right. it had a super cool forest there too. So it's like, okay, it doesn't smell like I'm in a garbage dump. But yikes, does it, is it hard to stick around here? We didn't stay there that night. We just were like, okay, let's hang out. Let's look at the stuff. We ate some food, which actually was okay because we were, got inside and it smelled more like the food. But everywhere else we went smelled like sulfur. Interesting. So we're like, let's... Let's get out of here. I wonder how those people's noses have changed and adapt to that going on. Yeah. The people who live there. there were, it was a big touristy place because of all the things that you could see. So it was like right. plenty of people go there by choice and stay there. So I don't know, man. That is fascinating. It's crazy. Well, according to some chemists, they believe mm-hmm. that there's an enhanced reactivity to these compounds in our olfactory sensors mm-hmm. because... Our body has figured out to use the copper in our bodies Mm -hmm. to enhance the reaction to it. Oh. Yes. So it was hard for me to understand in this paper that I was able to find if it was because the copper enhances the binding. So more molecules are able to bind. Uh It's called a binding constant. So is there more molecules binding for the same concentration or if it just somehow the copper makes the signal stronger without Uh making the actual binding of the molecule stronger. But the presence of copper, and I think there's not a ton known about this because it was a relatively recent paper. The the presence of copper Mm -hmm. with specific olfactory receptors will enhance the awareness of sulfur thiol compounds, and that's why we smell it so strongly. And I feel the author put it better than I can. Okay. So I'm just going to quote from this paper about copper and olfactory reception. Okay, sweet. The absence of a metal effect in an extensive screening using, just to paraphrase, other olfactory receptors for ligands, including alcohols, amines, sulfides, thiols, and carboxylic acid indicates the metal effect now present in both humans and mice may be a restricted phenomenon within an organism's olfactory system and may be specific to certain compounds where sensitivity is of utmost importance. So translated, that means 
that the metal effect essentially is very rare and only used in instances where it is very, very important, likely for survival, Mm -hmm. like in the case of thiols. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And this is in the presence of copper, which is naturally occurring in our body. That is so weird. What the heck? I know. So stinking weird. So this paper just came out in 2016, Mm -hmm. and it gives a lot of information on how one specific olfactory receptor will respond specifically to thiol odorants with ionic copper to activate strongly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give a lot of the mechanism that I can understand because it gets back into that physiological side, but it makes clear that alcohols are unreactive in this same olfactory receptor. Huh. It's pretty incredible. And this again was in 2016, which is not that long ago. Yeah. So I would assume that a lot of smells and what's going on with this is still being discovered. This is one of the first times that they could find copper's role in human olfaction. They said it hadn't been demonstrated before Mm -hmm. this paper. So that's kind of a new thing that's recently come out that copper is something that plays a part in the activation of these olfactory receptors, but Uh they are likely part of the 100 million fold improvement between regular old alcohols and thiols. That's so, so nuts. Isn't it? You know what I just thought about? What? Well, I was just thinking like, why do I need to be that strong? But what if it's that, this sulfur, okay, so you can make a robotic nose. Mm -hmm. It smells everything the same. Mm-hmm. based on how much of the molecules are in the air. Mm-hmm. So like if you got a cup of coffee right near it, it's going to be smelling coffee. If you got one further away, it might be smelling less or whatever. Yeah. What if there's actually like not tons of the sulfur molecules in the air, but it's just that we're so good at smelling it that that's why it smells so strong. Right. Like what if there isn't a lot of it? It's just that we're like, we're like, oh my gosh, what does that smell? And it's like, so there's that's a little one bit. one of the possibilities. And our bodies are like, wow, 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 wow. Mm-hmm. Right alert, there's sulfur. And they make us smell it really strong. So that is definitely what's happening. There mm-hmm. are less sulfur molecules in the air. We can detect them 100 million times easier. Yeah. So if there was one sulfur molecule and 100 million alcohol molecules, mm-hmm. we would detect the sulfur-containing thiol the same as the 100 million alcohol molecules. Gosh. Crazy. Yes. Very crazy. But the question is about the mechanism behind that. Yeah. And how does it do that? Mm -hmm. Is it that the one binds more strongly somehow because of the copper? Or what? What is the mechanism that's making that signal so much stronger? And the copper seems to play a role in the enhanced detection. Yeah. But from what I can find, we haven't elucidated that yet. Got it. There are likely people right now who are doing research on this Mm -hmm. because in the chemistry world, 2016, 2019 as a second paper on that would be a pretty quick turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. And think about 2020. Yeah. So that would be very quick. So things are still happening for sure. So that's my guess as to where they're at with this. There's still research going on and we're going to learn more. So it's not as satisfying as some of the other topics, but that's because I'm talking to you about research that is going on right now. This very moment, Mm -hmm. someone or many people are chipping away at trying to figure this out. Right. That's so crazy. So that's a shorter one, but that's why... We smell smells yeah. the way that we do. Yeah. Thiols, bad smells. And I was going to tell you some things that have those thiols in them. Uh-huh. Rotten eggs. Uh-huh. Durian. Uh-huh. Rotting food. Like the other day, one of my roommates left chicken in the refrigerator for over a week. It smelled horrible. I wanted to die. That's so weird. A week is not that long. It had gone bad over a week ago. Oh, got it. It was mm-hmm. bad for a week. Okay, mm-hmm. got it. Yeah. I was like, that's okay. It was bad. Or. And it was in a in a grocery bag. So I was like, what's in here? And I opened it and I was like, oh. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> also, like we talked about two weeks ago, the chemicals for perming, mm-hmm. that smell, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how that 
went from that to this it's, and it wasn't like I said on purpose. Right. It's ammonium thioglycolate, mm-hmm. I believe. And so thio is because mm-hmm. there's a thiol Gosh. in that compound that they uh-huh. put on your hair. Fascinating, right? This is way cool. Yeah, that's crazy. So that's all I have for you. If okay. you can explain that back to me, kind of a weird abstract one to explain, mm-hmm. then I'll give you two fun facts about our noses and smelling. Okay. I'm going to try. Great. I believe in your ability. Everybody, cheer me on from your respective cars and headphones, and let's hope <laughs> we all get these fun facts as a reward. Okay, so bad smells. There's two types of main what do you say like chemicals or compounds or categories of of stuff thiol and alcohol well those are just two really similar things alcohols and thiols have really similar chemical properties but for some reason one interacts with the nose like whoa and okay. the other one doesn't but they're very similar they're chemically worth, they're worth comparing because they're similar similar chemically yes like if but, i dunked one in a reaction and the other in a reaction they would act very similarly okay they have very similar properties chemically. Which is why their mm-hmm. comparison is so interesting because yes. when it comes to our noses, they're so different. Yes, which is baffling. So, for instance, like the sulfury bad smells are mm-hmm. a lot of times thiols. Mm-hmm. And this recent information mm-hmm. from 2016 um, says that copper, which is already just in our bodies, and we already have a, a stockpile of it, I guess, mm-hmm. helps us be able to crank up our ability to be sensitive to the smells of thiols and sulfury type of bad smells. Yes. Kind of like, uh, my my thought would be like, kind of like Wi-Fi versus Ethernet. Oh, okay. So Wi-Fi, it's there. Even if you get a good signal, it's it's there and you can connect and stuff like that. But as soon as you plug in Ethernet, you have a direct connection. Your internet speed is going to be way faster. Yeah. Insanely faster. So you get a little copper in there. Not totally certain yet exactly what thing it's doing. But somehow the copper just immediately allows a better connection or allows it to have be more sensitive or that signal something yeah that just boosts the signal a lot and it's not like there's more abundance that's why i picked that yeah thing. it's not like you suddenly got more internet because you switched internet service providers or something like that it's like you just take a different path you're, you're introducing something new right and it just makes the signal way stronger that is a great way to describe it and so you get that copper in there and then you can smell those bad smells way better, which is so nice that we can do that now. So Gross. thanks, Copper. That is a really good description. Yeah. I mean, this one, I was worried because it's kind of abstract. It's, yeah. I don't have a lot of answers. There are still a lot of questions. And those thiol chemists, copper nose chemists, if you're yeah. out there, please reach out to me. I'd love to have a conversation about how you would explain this to to us and give us more information in detail. Mm -hmm. But until then, this is what we have. And a lot of science is, this is what we know right now. So I was a little worried, but you knocked it out of the park. So that means we get the reward, right? That means you get the reward. So I've got two fun facts for you. Okay. One, why do some things not smell? Yeah. Why don't they? Yeah. Why don't they? It's a weird, you know, it's a weird thing that some don't smell. There's two reasons that I can think of. Okay. One is some things don't vaporize, really. Mm -hmm. Metals don't have a super strong smell Mm -hmm. because it's hard for them to vaporize. Right. Sometimes I think we get metal ions and maybe we have some of that, but but metal is not going to smell as strongly as like fresh baking bread. Right, right. So sometimes things just don't vaporize. Mm -hmm. Some things do vaporize and we can't smell them. Okay. We call those odorless. Mm Mm-hmm. My suspicion is, although I was not able to confirm this, Mm -hmm. that there's no olfactory receptors for those things to signal a smell. Got it. Because I don't think, I think the only thing that makes something odorless is that we can't smell it. Mm -hmm. But can we not smell it because it doesn't have a smell or can we not smell it because we don't have the ability to understand it or like receive it? So I was wondering if mice have 1,000 olfactory receptors. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Can they smell things that we can't smell? Maybe yeah. carbon monoxide has a smell to them. Yeah. So I was just thinking about that. Dude, yeah. That was a fun thing to stir in there. Mm-hmm. I like that. Kind of like, are there colors that we can't see? Yeah, the whole mantis shrimp thing we talked about. Exactly. Few, whatever, that, whenever that was from Radio Lab. Um, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. It, it would make sense that that'd be the case. You could mm-hmm. have more receptors, be sensitive to more things, because surely, I mean, maybe you can make that argument like the hound dog thing. Like, maybe they have more and they can smell more. So, like, that's why they can trace a person. Right. It's like, they can smell all these things that we can't. Yeah. That we think don't have a smell. Interesting, right? Yeah, that's crazy. The other thing mm-hmm. is not all thiols smell bad to us. Uh-huh. It could be the dosage at which they start to smell bad. I couldn't also find a ton of information on this. Mm-hmm. But there are thiols in citrus fruit Mm -hmm. like grapefruit Mm -hmm. there are thiols present in that but it smells good to us Uh uh-huh and they tested to see if it was above or below human detection limits and it is above the levels of human detection limits in fresh squeezed grapefruit juice Mm -hmm. or orange juice there are thiol vapors present that's so weird but somehow it combines with all the other things going on that it doesn't smell like rotten eggs to us. Yeah. Yeah, I I would even have thought that they would be like on totally different spectrums of stuff chemically with the smells. Like I would have right. just thought, you know, sweet, citrusy, kind of tangy smells over here. Right. Horrible, sulfury smells over here. I just not would have would have not thought that they would have anything in common at all. Yeah, it was super interesting. There was a whole long, long lit list there's a paper that just basically took every compound and identified every single molecule molecular compound mm-hmm. mo- molecule present in s- grapefruit and citrus fruits and there is a special thiol that they call the grapefruit thiol mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's also i think hydrogen sulfide gas was one of the things that was present which is what makes rotten eggs smell bad man isn't that weird? Yeah. So I thought those were two fun, weird facts that don't take a, or need a lot of explanation, but are just, huh, interesting. Yeah. That is really interesting. So there you go. Wow. That's the chemistry of smells. The mystery and the craziness of smells continues. We learn a little bit, but we we'll also have more questions as we go. Yeah. And smells that work in 1991, it was one of the last ones of our senses to be fully elucidated or to Mm. be again being elucidated yeah so i thought that was interesting too so i learned a lot about smells it was really fun preparing for this episode but i think i still have a lot of questions and i'm hopeful that i will learn more and maybe even be able to meet some of the people doing this work so that i can teach you guys Mm -hmm. more that'd be awesome i'd love that so that's all for the chemistry let's move into talking some about our weeks deal so I had a good week. I've been burning the midnight oil. Oh, have you been? Working hard. Working hard or hardly working? It that You could call it either. <laughs> I've been trying to catch up on movies. Oh, interesting. The Osc- okay. The Oscars are coming up. Well, yeah, because you're going to have a child soon and mm-hmm. your brain's not going to do very well yep. when it's that sleep deprived to actually be able to take in the movies. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure how many years more I can try to keep up with the Oscars deal. And I don't like, you know, keep up with every single category. But I always use the Best Picture nominee list as a list of ones that I'll see. And there's many times that really good movies are not in that list. So it's not perfect at all. It's pretty flawed sometimes. Um, and some years it's been super flawed, head-scratchingly flawed. Head-scratchingly flawed. <laughs> so, but this year I think it's pretty good. And okay. so I've been trying to catch up on watching those movies. I know nothing about movies, so... Okay, well, here's a list. I'll tell you which ones I've seen and in the order and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm ready. the first one I saw was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It came out... Oh, I did see that one. In the one. fall, I think. In fall. the summer. Summer? Was it really? Yeah, you're right. It was when I just moved in with my new roommates. So summer, saw that one. And then I saw Jojo Rabbit, um, I think, in like November sometime. Mm-hmm. And those were the only ones I had seen on this list. I have the, been told to see Jojo Rabbit, but I have not been able to do so. I think you'd like it. Okay. It's There's a little bit of everything in there in a surprising way. It's funny and irreverent and also then like really, really critical and thought-provoking and then also sad. No, but I hate Wes Anderson and 
I get the feeling it might be like Wes Anderson movies. I don't, I would not say that it's like that. Okay. All right. I trust you. It just, I think partly because it takes place in such a real scenario, even though there's a lot of like fictionalized elements to it. Um, it's based on a real book. All Wes Anderson stuff for the most part is like totally fiction, his own universe kind of deal. It's like, this is Hitler youth, Nazi stuff going on. Okay. Um, saw that one in November and then in the last two weeks, or maybe I should say like three based on when this one comes out, this episode, I've seen, um, little women. How was that? I really want to see that one. Super good. Haven't not watched the old ones. So, and I don't care to see them. I'm not ever going to now. Nope. But I would read the book. Um, marriage story. Very sad. Very good. Um, that one's on Netflix right now. Yes, it is. Go watch it now. Um, and don't watch it alone. Um, I'm not going to give a review of all these. And then I saw uh, 1917 and saw a Joker. Actually, saw a Joker before all those. And then I'm almost done with The Irishman. I've had to split it into three sessions because it's like three and a stinking half hours long. Wow. That's a very, very long. It's the one I was looking forward to watching the least. And I've been surprised by it the most because I was so oh. thinking I would hate it and thinking well, yeah. I'd be waiting for it to be over. So I feel like be- low expectations often leads to being present, pleasantly surprised. It really does. So just think all these movies are going to suck and then go see them all. <laughs> okay. But the action is better than I expected. And um, break it up into three parts. You might feel the same way. <clears throat> the only ones left to have to see are Parasite and Ford versus Ferrari. I'm so close. And then it makes it really fun to watch the Oscars and try to see which one's going to win. Because mm. you feel pretty informed, about, at least about the main ones. Um, and your degree is in film. So this in a lot of ways is, is like an exercise in your professional opinion and, mm -hmm. and critique and skills. Yes. And it is really fun. I mean, there's so many movies that come out every year. It is fun to be kind of given a list of like, here's some really highly regarded ones from this year. Mm -hmm. Go check these out. There's also a lot of other really good movies that came out, but it's kind of cool to see this and then try to predict which thing is going to win or root for one that you really want to win. Yeah, I think it's hard to imagine what that would look like in the chemistry world. But if there was one of those in my profession, I would really, yeah, I would enjoy something like that. Okay, review all these mm -hmm. things, like presentations or something from some of these renowned, maybe yeah. the Nobel Peace Prize. But yeah, you know, it's hard to know all the research that goes on in the world. So yes, yeah. that is really cool. I yeah. I could see how that, especially given your field, would mm -hmm. be one of the things you look forward to every year. Yes, and a couple years ago, a movie I was really cheering for it was kind of an underdog did win and it was such a cool year that if it's been um fun to to be as into the oscars since then but yeah so that's been my what, week and last couple weeks would you mind telling me what the movie that you really hoped would win that did win was it was moonlight oh and it beat la la land and it was a whole deal because the envelopes actually got switched did yeah. you read that mm -hmm. and there was a very interesting i think it was radio lab about um human error and oh no i think it was 99 percent invisible mm -hmm. it was about human error and poor design and how that envelope could have been de designed Vox so design too. Yeah. much better yep mm -hmm. to avoid the human error and the fact that they didn't anticipate the human error mm -hmm. is ridiculous yep so moonlight won and i was cheering for it from the very beginning and it really deserved the win for sure wow that's yeah. so cool i haven't seen moonlight or la la land definitely see moonlight what about you what's been going on this week for you one thing that I've been notice, noticing and really appreciating lately is my students. And I talked about this some at the end of last semester, but mm -hmm. they're just such a bright spot in my days and weeks where they will hang out in the area outside my office and they have formed a, there's a kind of a core group that's formed a study group. And anytime anyone else mm -hmm. comes around and asks questions, they're happy to help. It's just really a nice, inspiring thing to see in yeah. students who are struggling in a class that can be very hard. And so it's just really an enjoyable part of my, of my week and semester in life really where I get yeah. to see them be kind to one another and have gotten to grow to know them and know about their lives and enjoy their kind of unlikely friendships with one another. And so no matter else, no matter what else is kind of going on in my life at this time, like, <laughs> If I'm stressed or I've got school or whatever, when I'm working with them, all the things I have to do leave my mind and I just am able to zoom in and enjoy 
seeing them learn and grow and help each other. So that's been something that I've really, really enjoyed over the last several, really several months. Cause even yeah. into last semester. That's awesome. I even met a few of those guys talking yeah. about today mm-hmm. and they seem way cool. I wouldn't be the best person to like judge it, but they were obviously hanging out studying together. So yeah, that says a lot. Yeah. So that's probably it for me. Well, thanks for coming up here for meeting my students and coming up to my office to learn about the cutting edge of bad smell chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you listeners for tuning in. So Melissa and I have a lot of ideas for topics of chemistry in everyday life, but we want to hear from you. So if you have questions or ideas, you can reach out to us on Gmail, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Chem for Your Life. That's Chem, F-O-R, Your Life, to share thoughts and ideas. If you enjoy this podcast, you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you really like it, you can write a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us to be able to share chemistry with even more people. If you'd like to help us keep our show going and contribute to the cost of making it, go to ko-fi.com slash chem for your life and donate the cost of a cup of coffee. This episode of Chemistry for Your Life was created by Melissa Collini and Jam Robinson. References for this episode can be found in our show notes or on our website. Jam Robinson is our producer, and we'd like to give a special thanks to A. Collini and S. Flint, who reviewed this episode. Mm-hmm.